Yeah, thanks very much uh, also for uh, hosting this innovation. I think we have a quite fancy um, discussion ahead. We prepared it a lot, so that uh, it will be quite some uh, interesting topics ahead. I would like just to put it into perspective what we just heard. I would like to quickly emphasize uh, two, three points. First of all, <clears throat> as I learned some weeks ago, um, I also didn't know data art that much. Um, but there are so many companies in the blockchain area who are saying that they can implement things. And what uh, Dennis just uh, presented uh, are projects which actually happened. And it's not prototypes, it's real-life uh, projects. So uh, the company organizing this together with uh, ZEB is a company who did real-life projects, but and that's a problem not in Germany, but in other countries. So that's also kind of a criticism that uh, companies in uh, other countries like UK, Singapore and US um, feel that they are more speedy um, than what's happening in Germany. That's, uh, but just as a remark, to put it into perspective, what you see here are real-life projects, not PowerPoint slides and not prototypes, but things which really happened. Then the second point of time concerning the panel discussion, just to put it into the right perspective, there are two huge domains as outlined previously. There is the enterprise domain, that is the B2B area, that's uh, permissioned um, blockchains, um, that's frameworks like Hyperledger, Corda and, and, and Ethereum uh, for, a, for the company context. And there are public blockchains, um, that's the area of Bitcoin, Ethereum and uh, the cryptocurrencies. Uh, you, need, you always need to distinguish between these two domains because today we are mainly will talk about the first domain, that's the enterprise domain. So this is not about uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum and so on. Because many problems which we see in the Bitcoin area are not existing in the, in the enterprise domain. So things like huge electricity consumption and also terrorist financing, all this stuff, this is not happening in the enterprise domain. And the enterprise domain, this is the focus of tonight. And um, the last point I would like to quickly emphasize is, um, um, may, or maybe ask yourself, who of you guys um, do know already a lot about blockchain? Uh, you can dig very, very deeply. Who, who knows some things about blockchain? Let's call it that way. Who of you know uh, Ethereum? That's 60%. Uh, who of you knows Hyperledger? That now it's getting uh, less, uh, 50%. Who of you knows Corda? That's maybe 5%. These are the three core frameworks for the enterprise uh, domain. Who of you owns Bitcoins? Be careful because this is tax relevant. Uh, so <laughs> if I would be the German government, I will now um, identify um, the faces. Let's see what happens. Okay, um, we, will, we will now have a, a panel discussion about all these topics, most important the enterprise um, domain. Uh, I, actually, I, from my perspective, would be, it would be best that each panelist is presenting himself uh, because otherwise uh, it's, uh, I, I cannot express um, the, the, the specific keys of each panelist himself. So maybe uh, everybody who is panelist, Daniel, Faser, and everybody come here. What? Do you think where blockchain will go? Um, is it important? Do we need it or do we do not need it? Um, um, but maybe let's, let's just have a seat and then like person by person everybody expresses um, his key message and also quickly presents himself. So maybe Fasa, you would like to start? Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is Fasa, it's a bit tricky to pronounce. Uh, I work for the Royal Bank of Scotland. I'm a distinguished engineer there. Um, I also used to work at Deutsche Bank, so maybe World Bank, that's more, more close to home. Um, and I've, my history is within, with trading systems and risk, uh, but around 2014, we became very interested in the space around uh, blockchains, distributed ledgers, uh, cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, so we've had a journey, uh, which I'm really delighted to share with you tonight. Uh, so that's me. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alexander Barodich and my background actually I was quite successful venture capitalist before I have invested into several blockchain companies in 2015 and then I decided to uh, look into the enormous growth of such companies I decided to jump in into the, this sphere so we have started the development of currently it's the fastest and the cheapest blockchain in the world and uh, I will tell you more about that later. And we do believe that the, the blockchain as a technology, not as a cryptocurrency, 
it would be the next huge wave of the technology disruption even more than the internet was. And the centralization, it would be the next, the technological wave, which we would like to be the part of that as a universal blockchain. And we think that the era of Bitcoin and Ethereum, as you said, has actually over, and we will see a lot of new fancy blockchains next year. And Universal will be hopefully one of them. Thank you very much. Good evening, my name is Daniel. Um, my disclaimer is I'm a construction, um, I'm a civil engineer by profession, so I'm not a techie. Um, I'm more looking through the um, business side on, on the new technology blockchain. I co-founded Nexus Squared back in 2015, an accelerator program for early stage blockchain startups, and since then I have been involved in many projects. I co-organized Block Show in April um, this year here in Munich. Um, maybe some of you have been um, at that conference. I also co-founded the Bundesverband Blockchain in summer this year. Um, with, together with Philip, we had a great um, summer camp in Frankfurt where we actually prototyped a lot of um, very cool ideas, um, very innovative, uh, based on Ethereum. And I'm currently also working for Unternehmertum and running the incubator um, there. So I try to connect all the different dots, but I'm mainly in the field of um, startups, um, innovation. And my key message is actually that I um, fully agree with the two um, colleagues um, on my left side. I do think blockchain will be the next big thing, um, but to get actually to the goal and to reach the goal, I do think we need to collaborate on every um, level whatsoever. So we do need um, the corporates, the startups, uh, universities, politics, um, regulation, um, lawyers. So we need to bring them all on one table in order to make it happen. Hello everybody, my name is Andreas Fletcher. I work for Deutsche Börse within a group product and business development where we have been looking at blockchains in several years now, uh, building prototypes, uh, looking into process flows, looking into what blockchains are out there technology-wise, how can you apply it to business processes. And since Deutsche Börse Group is a market infrastructure provider, we believe we definitely have to look at uh, this kind of technology to evaluate if we can profit from it, but also if our customers can profit from it. Yeah, thanks very much. So, a uh, quick note about me. Um, I'm working at the Frankfurt School of Finance. Uh, we are running the blockchain center there, the Frankfurt School Blockchain Center, and we are trying to also uh, do knowledge um, transfer uh, in Frankfurt concerning um, both the public blockchain domain and the enterprise blockchain domain. Actually, to be very, very honest, it's not easy um, because uh, businesses are businesses running rather good in Frankfurt, so people don't partly don't have the pressure, or let's call it incentive, to really deal with this topic. But from my perspective, and we we'll talk about this uh, now, um, in my mind, uh, the blockchain technology, as you also said, uh, will uh, change uh, very uh, many things, very many industries, very many um, business processes. And therefore, sometimes I think um, some perspective, some uh, specific projects could really start a little bit quicker. Some more um, engagement could uh, could help actually. Um, but that's only my perspective um, because what we see in Germany is um, that uh, you see industrial companies like Daimler and others who are quite advanced, uh, who are trying to do things in this area. Uh, also in Frankfurt, there are uh, quite a, a number of financial organizations which are. Um, doing quite a lot, but if we look outside Germany, um, then we see uh, much more happening. That, that applies to the UK, but it also applies to, to Singapore, the US, um, partly to the to, um, to, uh, Arab countries. And um, therefore, my first question would be, so uh, where is enterprise blockchain heading? Um, is it really worth the entire high watch we are seeing? Or is it still kind of underestimated, which Probably is not true, but what's your opinion here, Fasad? Um, so, so I think we're finding some really interesting lessons from the last few years, where that which help us understand what the future is going to be. Uh, the first one was that it's not like a 
technology that you can just replace a database with. It's not, a, it's not really designed for that. Uh, it's, a, it's a completely different way of working together. Uh, and it's really designed for collaborative engagements. So collaboration is a crucial element, which I think you guys have been talking about as well. Um, so we didn't really find, so there's only so much fun you can have with a blockchain on your own. We, we discovered that pretty quickly. We did a few projects where it was all internal within the bank for one single team, and really, no, everyone looked at it and went, well, why didn't you just build it with a database? Right. Um, and, and then something really interesting happened. The consortium started forming. So we have, we were members of the various consortiums, one of them is R3. It's incredibly, I mean, it's, I can't, I can't uh, exaggerate how important it is to have that kind of space that you can work with together. Uh, so we've, as a result of that, banks that normally wouldn't normally engage with each other, who wouldn't engage in projects together, some would have a table to return to. Um, can you hear me okay? You'll tell me if you can't. Yeah, great. Um, they have a table that they can uh, meet around and form small projects. And we found that um, in the space, for example, in where there's payments, the regulatory space, the regulatory reporting space, um, and, and some, some interesting work around effects that we're doing at the moment, there's plenty of opportunities with, with blockchains as long as and decentralized ledgers, as long as there is a collaboration between the parties. Um, how's that thing with the NASA? Is that getting there? So, um, you mentioned MAS, you mentioned Singapore um, and other regions, and it's interesting that each region seems to have its own path, and some, some are faster than others. So, certainly, we're seeing quite a lot of movement within Singapore. Um, and in the UK, um, we found that uh, by engaging with our regulators as closely as possible, so we've got two projects that we've done with the regulator, and one of them has been well, well documented in the press. Um, having that engagement from the outset really helps uh, create that sort of collaboration you really need to get everybody moving together. So, key points. Um, consortiums are really useful. Uh, engaging everybody around the table at the same time and doing small projects that are, which are kind of experiments to begin with helps the future. Um, does that answer your question? So, um, despite the Brexit, uh, you are full speed um, into the blockchain area. But just to, to really understand what you're doing. So, in London, you're sitting together with your competitors. And with the central bank, did I get this right? You yes, with the FCA. So okay. with the competitor and, and the FCA, and the regular, so yeah. you're sitting together with them mm -hmm. and thinking about new projects. I think this is interesting because it's uh, an entirely new aspect, um, which is also conflicting uh, with cartel law and uh, things mm -hmm. like this, because um, you need a common infrastructure mm -hmm. for information. Why is this, or how does it how does it work? Uh, so uh, there's a couple of things I wanted to mentioned actually. So first of all, when we get together, we don't uh, have a very high bar for success. We kind of set the bar kind of a little bit low because we like to just try and experiment. So we usually do something in the order of about one or two weeks. And at the end of those two weeks, we take a cut and say, how was that? Did that work? Was it good? Um, so we did one project with the FCA, which was regarding mortgage reporting. It's not the, the most glamorous of subjects. But it turns out that it has an enormous amount of costs and latency to get the data together uh, on a monthly cycle uh, to produce the kind of reports that show where the country is going in terms of mortgages. Um, so the proof of concept was pretty simple and a real-time project, a real-time system that everybody contributes into and, can, and, the, and, the, and the FCA can see a real-time view of the mortgages but with the private data being scrubbed. So there were concerns around, requirements around privacy uh, and requirements around mortgage transfer, some new features as well like mortgage transfers, which currently there isn't a mechanism to do that. And that's what we built. And in, in a couple of weeks we had a good answer, which was very positive. Yeah, thanks. Did that make sense? Does that Absol yeah, absolutely. So, so if what you can't hear me, so please ask questions. Just stick your hands up. Because I'm, I can't hear myself here, probably. <laughs> I think it, I think everyone can hear me. Yeah, I think everyone. 
Now what's your opinion? Where, where is the enterprise domain within blockchain heading? Uh, being on, on the blockchain side, not on the enterprise, not on the um, uh, P2P side, I would say that we have a couple of pilots currently up and running on the universal blockchain which are showing their the efficiency which we could achieve using the blockchain. First of all, the, I would assume that the blockchain is a, actually it's a glue on top of the different IT systems which can connect different currently not connected systems. Like for example, bank and credit score agency are not con well not well connected, but they might be connected instantly using the blockchain. They might use this an additional layer of IT technology just to verify, for example, the credit score of, of me as a customer. And then the credit score agency, both and bank, will write my new credit score to this public ledger, or probably consortium level ledger. But anyway, it may be very useful, instant transaction level. Um, the next domain is uh, if we can add any kind of data to this record, so it may help us to create the full history of each and everything which I'm producing through the supply chain. Because currently we don't have the history of the thing. If you are buying the, you know, the car, used one, you would like to, to know the history, but the, the, the seller will never ever tell you the truth, as you know. But using the blockchain, you will always have an access to this history. And for me, the most exciting part of the blockchain, that we actually have the immutable records of this stuff accessible from everywhere. Even if the bank don't want to share this uh, information, it exists in the blockchain. If you have a key, which is security part, you would be able to read it. And on top of that, the next domain is the, is the cryptocurrency stuff, which is currently the, a lot of banks are actually using the blockchain, especially for that, because you may use the liquidity field to avoid the payments itself. You may just mark the colored coins, which actually this coins belongs to him, this coins belongs to me, he sent me 10 coins, we are just recoloring these coins back to my color without any payments. No fees, no intermediate la layers, so it's, it's a huge savings on payments, instantly using the blockchains today, in real life. Yeah, just, just as a little addition, um, you first emphasized that, is, that the blockchain is able to synchronize information across companies. So that's actually the opposite of, of an SAP system. In the SAP system, one company is doing a purchase order and the other company is doing an invoice. But if you uh, see the, the, uh, the flow of goods, it's actually the same. The purchase of the one company is the invoice of the other company and the blockchain would put a joint underlying information yeah, yeah, absolutely never right. about I even, yeah. I even uh, have an example. If you have ever, ever tied to claim that tax-free, so in tax-free we have the seller, we have the customs, we have the tax-free agent, and we have the government who would like to produce this, uh, uh, I think, taxes back to the seller. So instead of that, we can have only one smart contract is on the blockchain, but only one, you know, invoice or whatever you will call it, this document, we shall change their state. Yeah, this nicely illustrates um, that there is no blockchain without collaboration across uh, companies, uh, because currently companies are maintaining their own systems. You have the invoice into one ERP system and the purchase order in another. And they are not system. connected at all. Exactly, exactly. And that's what blockchain will do. Yes, yeah. of course. Mm -hmm. That's something to, to what you just yeah, said. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Forgive me. Yeah. 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 We come to you guys. It's a discussion. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, there are two points there that you raised which really resonated with me. Um, one of them is that we definitely found that once you get the substrate, the baseline of an infrastructure for decentralized ledgers or blockchains or any of these technologies, it's much less expensive, much less expensive to introduce new business domains, new use cases and so on. It's, it's like a substrate that you can really build on very quickly. So I think that was, that was a great point. Um, I think the, the other side of it is just the, uh, the collaboration aspect. It just I cannot sort of stress how important it is as well. So, yeah, I think this is an, uh, so far not easy to answer question because uh, blockchain 
only works if you are really collaborating across companies and uh, laws, cartel laws, but also competition uh, strategies are absolutely conflicting with this and I think this affords a kind of a new thinking. So Daniel, what's your opinion? Um, where will the enterprise domain go concerning blockchain technology? Well, I already have to excuse myself for that. Um, a few aspects. I think history shows that true innovation and disruption doesn't come out of the corporate world. So corporates are not made for innovation. Um, that's point one. Um, the second one, I really admire what you say that you have uh, um, R3, you also have uh, B3i, and that's great. But if you have a closer look at that, what is happening is all the big guys are sitting around the table trying to be in a safe environment and then they actually claim to make true innovation. But what they really do is actually they, they take an hip technology and try to implement their existing processes into a new technology. And that's not innovation at all. And I also think that blockchain is not made for um, historically well running systems and processes. So I think you should continue to do what you do, um, but really think out of, the, out of the box when it comes to blockchain. And another aspect is, if we all go back in history and have a close look at the white paper written by Satoshi Nakamoto that was actually published in 2008, when your whole industry didn't know how future is going to look like, and then some, somehow a guy or a girl or a group of people comes up with the idea of actually taking you out of this whole system. Then again, there's another um, point I would like to mention, that this technology is actually made for, for something different. And I think to really grasp what blockchain and the potential of the technology has is actually that um, we need to redefine ourselves and we need to um, not only think out of the box, but we also need to open up. Um, I mean, this um, I have been working for big corporate and I know what silos are. So within one company, colleagues don't want to share information they have. And if you now think about a decentralized technology, we all need to open up and that's why I claim we all need to go sit around one table and everyone brings in what they have and then that true innovation can happen. And that, I mean, look, Airbnb, it's, it's the biggest um, hotel company pr probably in the world, but they don't have a hotel, right? So that's, that's innovation, I think. So I don't think we should, we should harm ourselves and still think in our safe environment where we all feel safe and comfortable. We need to, we need to take actually the second step and even push it harder with all the stakeholders involved. So that's... But, but of course, by definition, this is difficult for uh, established companies. This is more like the, the startup field, um, at the same time having huge disadvantages, not having scale, not having regulatory um, um, conditions in place and so on. But I would, I would uh, partly agree that this is really interesting. Um, let, let's come to this point later, also when we talk um, a little bit about where innovation is coming from, from the domain. But uh, maybe, Andreas, you're working now at uh, a German corpor uh, corporate, the Deutsche Börse is rather active in this field. Um, actually, by definition, by definition, in theory, Deutsche Börse uh, should not exist anymore because you are an intermediary at its best. So blockchain uh, should render you obsolete by theory. I really, I really emphasize this because I'm not believing in this. Um, but what's, what's your opinion? So you obviously you see some chances, not just risks, otherwise you would go um, in this direction. Or what are your projects currently being uh, in the making? Okay, so to answer the, the first question first, uh, where does enterprise blockchain go? So away from blockchain, more to DLT. Yeah? So because uh, uh, blockchain and DLT is definitely not the same thing. And you can see that blockchain has unique features that the financial world cannot simply adapt to. So they're moving to more having decentralized ledger technologies. Another thing that uh, you can really see and has been mentioned uh, multiple times now already, 
um, people talk to each other. Yeah? And this is something that I think blockchain has changed in the whole industry. Uh, rival companies are talking to each other, thinking how you can change current business flows to new business flow. And you can see CEOs of financial companies talking about technology. This is something that normally does not happen very often. And uh, despite the fact if blockchain will be uh, promising in future, if it will be uh, adapted into production-based systems, etc., in the financial, I think this is something that will stick to the financial industry, to the, to the economic industry. They will start and continue talking to each other. Yeah? Um, so, yes, by theory, uh, Deutsche Börse should not exist anymore, typically Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper. Uh, for Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, you can see that uh, Satoshi Nakamoto's idea was, uh, uh, was interesting, but it didn't work because you can also see intermediaries popping up in the cryptocurrency space, new cryptocurrency exchanges, so instead of eliminating, eliminating uh, exchanges, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto probably has uh, established hundreds of cryptocurrency exchanges and companies that are intermediary within the cryptocurrency space. And um, within Deutsche Börse Group, so we've been looking at blockchain technology and, and DLT for several years now, um, more out of the motivation of understanding what this technology is, understanding what the business process is. Because often you can see use cases being implemented as prototypes in the industry, and the outcome is, oh, this works much better with blockchain. It'll probably work much better with other technology if you just reshape your, your use case or your processes and use centralized databases. So the fact that you're using blockchain for it could maybe make it more um, efficient, but the fact that you are rethinking how you're doing the business flow and the process flow is probably the biggest uh, takeaway of, of this technology for, for big companies because they challenge themselves and they challenge within their own in, in, within their own silos how to make things better for themselves and their customers. But, but <clears throat> are large companies uh, really good at challenging themselves? So, <laughs> <laughs> so since, since since we've been doing uh, several years blockchain in, in I can say for Deutsche Börse, yes. For other companies, I cannot say this. I don't, I don't know other companies. I would agree because in, in Germany, I would say uh, Deutsche Börse and some others, they are kind of first movers. Um, but other companies, they are uh, not that advanced yet, let's call it that way. Um, therefore, I would, I would perfectly agree. So, but you know, to quickly summarize, um, Blockchain technology is um, about increasing efficiency of existing processes uh, like streamlining information, data sharing and so on. But Daniel mentioned an important point that it's also about new business models. Um, the question is where are they coming from? You know, uh, Any company out there can try to streamline its processes like uh, improving information sharing or information symmetry. But on the other hand side, um, where is information really coming from? Is it maybe if um, a bank is cooperating with a car manufacturer that can also be coming up uh, some business models or is it uh, partly coming out of the startup domain uh, or um, out of nowhere, let's call it that way. So um, would it be possible, that would be the next question, would it be possible that through blockchain technology, including the cultural change which uh, might uh, be induced by it, would it be possible that blockchain technology also um, helps challenging the business models of existing companies also leading to quite some risks um, because new business models are coming out of nowhere from startups, maybe also from uh, companies outside the countries. What's your opinion? So, after about a few years of doing this, we've, we've come to the conclusion that uh, blockchains and potential DLTs distribute decentralized ledger technologies are all about decentralization and decentralization if, if, if you know we did one project a few years ago with with ireland so the country of ireland and the banks in ireland uh, as a way of basically stopping SEPA, not using SEPA, but using a more efficient mechanism using the dnc um, in fact there was actually a, a cut of ethereum that we used um, to do that. And 
very soon we discovered that as a scope, as a project continued and the scope got smaller and smaller, it really became, uh, the solution became something like a joint venture between the banks, where they wanted to kind of set up maybe a new, a new central company that created the services in order for the transfer of funds to occur. But as soon as you've done that, you obviate the need for blockchains because it's no longer a decentralized approach. Once you have a joint venture, it's not decentralized. It's only through a different kind of use case, a different kind of work. Your ops model needs to change as well, right? So we typically in our companies have our own ways of managing source code, building our systems, testing those systems, deploying them in a decentralized world. Well, what does that look like? You know, you and I are going to have to share a contract together. How do we make sure the version control of that control contract is done correctly? Our audit processes need to be accordingly synchronized as well. Our entire ops model needs to be synchronized. So our view is that you can't do this kind of thing without decentralizing a lot of other things as well. Um, and that's okay. I mean, we're, we're actually challenging that. And I think a point that you raised earlier, Daniel, about we need to push ourselves more, I so agree with that. Um, we tend to build on some of the existing hierarchies, the existing ways of doing things, and almost want to be in that kind of comfort zone. The next stage is going to be very tough, and we're going to have to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Just a little bit. I think the process should be the same. We simply at that very, very initial stage of the learning curve. It's not about the change in the process in organization. It's about the change in processes between the organizations. And in a competitive world, we were, you know, I, I, actually I was against him because we were competitors. In decentralized world, there is no competitors. They are cooperative parties. And it's quite the new mindset which we have to adapt I think in the next couple of years. In this case, could you please imagine that somewhere in Nigeria there are some people who would be able to borrow your money for you know for 10 percent and annual percentage, and they have an, a very awesome credit score which was proven by the blockchain. So would you lend them 100 euros by this 10 percent annually? Probably yes. If yes, so in this case the bank is obsolete. And it would be done by, by, by the blockchain. It's a simple example when it's cooperative model between people and people because we don't have the geography. My question to the, to the government, which, which, uh, which, uh, which country should we pay tax taxes if this procedure between two people, two physical people, person, was done by the smart contract at the blockchain, which was distributed and decentralized across the globe? There is no such geography as a globe. So we will have a lot of questions to the, to the, from the regulatory and legal point of view later on. But we will definitely have to switch to the cooperative domain. Because I think the blockchain is mostly about how to cooperate between the organization, not how to make our processes inside of the organization more efficient. I, this was a very, very, very interesting point because as we use the internet today, you can send out information across the globe. You can send an email, it, uh, one minute later it's somewhere in Nigeria or in Indonesia and so on. But with blockchain technology um, you can also send around value, that, that means money. can be an asset, can be a stock, can be real money and so on. You can send it directly from now to Indonesia, it will be there in, in a few seconds. And therefore I think this is a very, very interesting point. Um, because in, uh, sometimes I also question myself, why do we need blockchain in Germany? Because here we have a very, very uh, nicely working state. The, the government is uh, doing uh, the execution uh, in case there are any problems. But in other countries of the world, we do not have the state who is basically executing uh, things when there are problems. So uh, with blockchain technology, you suddenly now have a mechanism uh, to also um, help execution in, uh, in remote areas of the world where you might have a weak regime or maybe infl uh, inflationary currency and so on. And you can do transactions, value, loans, uh, escrow accounts, all this stuff based on uh, the blockchain technology. You are hinting a little bit to this and therefore sometimes I think we should also uh, think a little bit more when we talk about new business models, what's happening outside Germany or outside Europe or outside the OECD countries uh, where the uh, regimes are not that stable um, uh, because here execution is being done by the state ultimately. Yeah? Okay, but um, let's come back to 
of our storyline and not uh, go a little bit too far away from it. I would like to question um, where are uh, where are already nicely working products in place um, which might have already come out of the prototype uh, stage. Are there already nice examples out there which you have in mind or which you may partly uh, be operating with uh, where you see nicely working business models, systems and so on um, using blockchain technology because very often uh, people ask so if this technology is so great and if the Bitcoin price is uh, increasing day by day so why don't we use it yet? I think the enterprise level uh, system do not use the Bitcoin blockchain, at least I hope so. And in this case you shouldn't pay the price per transaction based on Bitcoin or based on Ethereum, especially if you have the fork system. Um, we have a couple of systems which has up and running for our clients based on Universal. First of all, it's a medical records for kids. It's quite obvious that actually the, um, for the social projects, uh, the, sorry for saying for say that, the companies or corporations, they are not eager to create such type of system. So we actually donated to the, to the Russian government the system to be able to create this uh, medical system for the kids on the blockchain just to store a couple of uh, information. First of all, it's a um, uh, blood code say it in English, but like the, the vital metrics, vital metrics, uh, metrics okay, interest, allergy yeah. metrics, etc, 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 to be able to check if the, because the kids, they are not, they, they don't have passports, and when they came to the emergency, it's crucial to be able to decide which medicine they, they, they can uh, take or which they have an allergy to. So it's, it was crucial to have the system, this decentralized system, to be able to check easily and instantly which uh, medicine we, they can use. So th that's, that's in Russia, you said? That's in Russia. So I go to the doctor, uh, maybe the doctor doesn't know me. Uh, so if you're okay. Okay, so I'm identifying myself somehow and then the blockchain basically delivers my health track record uh, to the doctor such that he knows. Uh, even if he doesn't know me, how I must be treated, right? If he doesn't know you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, true. Yeah. Yeah. And this is already working. If it's already working. How many, how many patients, what would you guess? We have just started, it was launched last Saturday, but uh, anyway, okay, it, it works for several people, for several kids. Currently at the base it's about five, five hundreds, it's, but it works for the several clinics in Moscow, so we have China. Yeah. It's, uh, it makes perfect sense, yeah, okay. Yeah, we, we have a couple of crypto, crypto examples, if you like, for example, in Universal we have 500,000, which looks more than 500 kids, but for me 500 kids, which we can say much more important than 500,000 users of Universal. 500,000 users of Universal would like to use Universal to swap cryptocurrencies, like for example, uh, between Bitcoin and Ethereum, both are cryptocurrencies. There is a lack of trust. If you send me Bitcoin, what motivates me to send you Ethereum? Vice right? versa, if you send it, me, to, uh, send it to me. So Universal is an escrow agent. Blockchain became intermediary between two parties, holding the funds at the smart contract just to send your uh, Ethereum back to me and Bitcoin back to the second party. Mm -hmm. And such escrow agents and the smart contracts, they are working now, so you may use it uh, if you'd like. And we have 500,000 of users who, who are actually playing with that at the testnet. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view, the Medical records and um, cadastral maps are much more important for, from the you know from the usage than the crypto-based blockchain mm -hmm. uh, examples. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. What about Deutsche Börse? Are you already in production state, or uh, or probably not yet? But when will it be? What can it be expected? Um, so we have three projects running. We have uh, LA Ledger running, which concentrates. Uh, cross-collateral movement with the Liquidity Alliance. The Liquidity Alliance is a group of CSDs uh, distributed globally um, that use uh, Deutsche Börse's Clearstream CMAX system for collateral management. Yeah? So this is in, um, um, in, in research phase. Yeah? Uh, the prototype has been built. And the current status is that you're talking with regulators to check if, so this is blockchain, can we use this? Yeah? The second project is a completely research project with the Deutsche Bundesbank, which focuses on what happens if you bring a digital coin 
and a digital bond or security onto a blockchain. And now you have two assets where you can do financial relevant functionalities such as a TVP or corporate actions. But this will never go in production because this is a purely research project with uh, one of the most important regulators in Germany. Uh, the third project that we're running is COCO, uh, basically bringing a collateralized coin onto a blockchain to ensure that you have credit risk payment within a blockchain. Uh, because this is one of the most important things currently missing within the blockchain industry. You do not have a unique uh, um, a payment solution where you eliminate the counterparty risk between two parties. Uh, and, and for us, this would be banks. Uh, without using cryptocurrencies, of course. Uh, cryptocurrencies, you said in the Bitcoin, and the Bitcoin is there. Uh, but we're not using Bitcoin. So all of these three projects are prototype stage. And the question if these will run into production is a question that has not been answered yet. Because for the financial industry, and especially for Deutsche Börse, because we are heavy, heavily regulated, um, we have to find use cases that make sense to use blockchain. Yeah? Um, just because I can build something with blockchain and it works does not mean that it is good to use blockchain. And, um, 95 of all use cases out there are, in my opinion, in my personal opinion, not blockchain use cases. Because mostly you still have, in some sort, um, a central authority uh, having governance over something. Even if you, you mentioned it, if you, if you do a consortium, you're building an IT system. Behind the IT system, there's always a system operator. A system operator is a centralized role, so he can do what it, it can be a centralized one, but the, the governance behind it is a centralized model. Huh? Uh, there are other projects that we're doing which, I mean, I, I don't think we can completely talk about. Uh, they're still exploratory at the moment, um, but generally they're within the We, we are under four eyes here, so Sorry? Yeah, it's entirely private what we're discussing. I can see that, yeah, yeah it's good. Um, I, I don't know, the, feature for us is, is to try and push one over the line into a pro the, the one thing that we did very get very close with but was shut down or paused at least for completely uh, unrelated reasons to the project was um, uh, banking for the unbanked uh, and providing services and it's an interesting concept where is a bank where is a bank uh, in this world of cryptocurrencies um, and we've been talking a lot about the facilities that we could provide if a lot of the common basic stuff that banks do is to some degree kind of simplified and, and, and homogenized across the industry so it's really cheap and really easy to transfer value around. So that was actually really popular uh, with, within the UK, within the experiments that we, we did and it was almost ready to go into production um, but it had to be paused for um, should we say, uh, sovereign reasons. So. Okay, but you said that uh, the projects um, yeah, induced some excitement and yeah. you expect that this excitement also turns into revenue maybe or into cost reduction next yeah, year. Yeah, so from, from, a, from a bank perspective, I think when it's interesting, we have to kind of be wearing the coat for a corporate because I'm, I'm just an engineer, that's all I am. Um, but I'd say that for the bank, they saw an opportunity where someone has done bad, uh, is given the opportunity to save or store their value somewhere, to be able to make payments really easily with it, uh, and, and, and to receive also payments from whether it's uh, you know, uh, an unemployment benefit, for example, and have an easy way of receiving that, a safe way, because there's a ton, of, a ton of reasons why the current system doesn't work. It doesn't work very well, it's unsafe, it's, it's unreasonable. Um, so we, we came up with an approach to that and we said, well, eventually they will find themselves in a position of employment. Eventually their value will go up and we could be there as a bank providing services in the future for them because when you open a bank account, I don't know about you, but not many people switch banks very often and uh, they tend to stay with their banks for quite some time. Um, if you ask them, why do you want to store your money, where is the safest place, they'll say that the bank is probably the safest place to store it at the moment. So we wanted to have that, yeah, be first in line, so to speak. 
Okay. But so, so now, why don't we see more real life project at this point of time, given uh, this huge amount of hype? We heard regulatory issues, uh, we heard uh, cultural issues, um, there might be technical issues. So, Daniel, what would your, what would, would be your opinion? What is the most pressing hurdle which we uh, need to take um, to have more real life applications? Well, I think there are already great existing exam examples out there of working blockchain projects. Um, not only within fintech, but also across other industries. And I think if you have a closer look at them, what they do, they reinvent or they rethink their industry. And they, get, they actually um, manage to, to take that second step. And, and I think if you think about blockchain as trust within a peer-to-peer -peer network, then actually magic starts to happen. And if you then think about blockchain as being one technology that can be added to another technology, so for instance, let's combine AI and blockchain, let's combine IoT and blockchain, um, then I think we are, we are really where we, can, where we can be at with that technology. Um, and I think what, what really harms us here in Germany, I think there are two things. Um, first, if you look, have a look at where innovation really happens is one, innovation happens when you know the needs and requirements of your customer, and then it's all about speed. And what we Germans do, we are um, excellent in really drilling down into the nitty gritty details of anything we do. I mean, made in Germany is still, is still great, uh, but we need, to, we need to change our attitude and our culture. So. What we tell our startups is um, get out of the basement where you sit in front of your computer and you think about detailed tax issues that your customer might face when they do this and that. And if they don't answer that question or they don't have an answer to that question, then they will never go out on the market. So I think if you have an idea, if you think it's great, if you have sp spoken to um, let's say a decent amount of potential customers and they like your idea, then go out and start doing and stop thinking about um, details. So I think that's one a cultural thing. Secondly, I think if you take a closer look on evolution, usually at some certain point in time you have a big crisis. So in Germany we didn't have a crisis for the last 60, 70 years, no war, no illness, no whatever. So we are stuck in our very, um, very great comfort zone and there's no need for us to actually go out of that comfort zone. So I actually, two years back, I opened um, a meetup group called um, Blockchain Meetup in Greece. So my bet is actually Greece, that something needs to happen there, right? Because the economics are down and this whole politic um, system is not working anymore. Because what happened, there was a crisis. So I think people now need to get innovative and think about new, new things. And how cool is it that we now have a technology um, that is actually able to build up trust within a peer-to-peer -peer network where you can rethink basically anything we are used to today. In terms and of value transfer. Yeah. In terms of value transfer, but also even more. I mean, there are use cases, and you know that, you, 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 you spent um, a, a very small fraction of a Bitcoin here and all of a sudden the light goes on in a school in India. So I think that's, that's innovation to me. And I think, um, so we need to really step out of our comfort zones. We need to open up. Um, we need to stop um, worrying about details. Um, and, I, and I mean, we had examples like the DAO hack, um, just recently another hack. Um, that's, I mean, that's fine. Um, it's, it's, we need that, and we need those downfalls so that the techies um, amongst us can rethink what they're currently working on. But I, 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 also, I also think, um, especially if I have a look around, um, again, this event, it doesn't matter which event I'm invited to or I attend, people tend to talk about the technology. They want to understand the technology in the detail. I tell you what, I probably send, let's say, 50 emails a day, or 100, or whatever. I don't have a fucking clue how it, 
how it works from a technology perspective. I just use it because it's convenient for me. I don't know how it works when I type in a text into my mobile phone and all of a sudden you have a text message in your mobile phone. So I think we need to get to the point where we need to stop worrying about the issues we currently face, so energy consumption, um, the, uh, the skyrocketing Bitcoin course, whatever there is out there, stop thinking about it. There will be a solution at a certain point in time where we can solve those issues and we need to start thinking about how this new technology can actually transform the way we are today used to make business. And I think we don't need to understand, I mean I'm a business guy, I don't need to understand the technology in the last detail in order to then think about what I can actually potentially do with that technology. Yeah, so you are an advocate of the, of the cultural uh, hurdles, but still, you know, uh, the regulatory bodies like the BaFin, they make us really care about the details, uh, because otherwise we have a problem, you, you emphasized it. So, so what would you like to emphasize? Uh, is the technology itself a problem? Um, can the technology scale? Um, we have so many uh, criticisms about this. And is the regulatory topic, is this an issue which is kind of really something like a handbrake, uh, which uh, like prevents us from taking speed? Being on the lookout of the technology side, of course the technology is not an issue. And uh, for sure we will see a lot of, uh, as I told you, a lot of uh, shiny new blockchains next year, a part of the universe. And uh, the, I would agree with Daniel that mostly it's a mindset. And we have to change the mindset. And of course you are right, we have to change the mindset, even the governmental mindset, the corporate mindset, our own mindset. And before we change it, we won't, we won't achieve the goal of integrating that decentralization mindset into the processes. Because we are really a very, very centralized in our you know, current life. It's not that easy to, to integrate the decentralization in our processes. We still, when, when I'm talking about my company, I'm talking that it's my company. Even despite the fact that it's a blockchain, it, it belongs to those who run our nodes. So we still not think our own in the decentralized way, and to what extent to implement it properly. But this is then also part of the cultural dimension and uh, making people understand what's happening um, there, even though it's a, still a tiny technology which is not okay. running yet. I, 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 will, I will continue the topic from Daniel. So we are at the point of 1993 Please remember that time when there is no browser at all. It was the Gopher and Telnet. It was two crazy tools for geeks, as currently Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then next year, 1994, the first two browsers were created. It was American Online and Netscape Navigator, which currently for us is the window to the internet. And we do not know to what extent that HTTP as a protocol which actually we type in before each and every internet address is actually is helping us to get to the, to, the, to the website. For us, the browser is the gate, is the gateway to the, to the internet. So we will see next year those windows to the blockchain. Currently we don't have. That's why it's so difficult, that's why it's so hard, that's why it's so you know, for geeks only. That's why it's mostly about the cryptocurrency and not about the technology itself. But we will definitely see the windows to the blockchain next year. Mm -hmm. So, so you, would, you wouldn't say that the technology right now is the main problem um, because there will be solutions coming up in the next six months, right? Blockchain is a very, very simple technology yeah, yeah. In, 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 you know, in, in nuts. And it's pretty easy to implement it. But from the corporate or governmental point of view, it's not that easy to implement this sharing part of the technology into you know, the public database. Sometimes it's even illegal. Well, you know, we, we found that this, it's actually quite easy to explain how the blockchains and, these, and decentralized ledgers can be used to share appropriately. We've been beginning to find patterns there, and we're taking the FCA through that process as a first part, as a sort of direct partner that we're working with. Um, the point that Daniel raised was really important I wanted to come back to, which was um, we tried probably, I can't remember how many experiments we've run over the last three years. Uh, 
So we have the concept of a spike, and you've probably heard of a spike, have you heard of a spike? So a spike is when you do a short experiment. So we have an experiment that we do, we talk to a business, a particular business within our world, we work out a particular use case, and then we get the folks together, our, our development teams, our product teams, our design teams, the, the business, we get them together for one or two weeks, and we build something, we get it working, and at the end of that, it's okay if it's failed. It's actually really great because we learn an awful lot about what we just did and improve it the next time. So I'm, I'm, I'm what Daniel said about not being afraid to fail uh, and trying things out and coming out of our little environments where we imagine what the, what the problems are going to be and working directly with the business. I think it's a really great one. Well, it, yeah. it, it, it depends on the boss you're having, right? Well, you know, we, we change minds. It's okay. You, can, you all can change minds, right? Yeah. Um, you, you would like to add something on the regulatory hurdles, which uh, might still exist? Sure, which sure. Exist. So, uh, I fully agree. I have no idea how my cell phone works, but I know what functionalities it has. I know what I can do with it, and that's the important thing. In terms of regulation, this is also important. Technology, to regulate technology is, I don't know if that makes too much sense, yeah? Um, but to regulate functionalities that the technology offers. That is the important thing, and I think that is where the current regulators are looking at. Um, current regulators do not want that you can send stocks all over the world um, to people you don't know, because we have KYC processes, we have AML processes. Yeah? And these are the things that, in, in my opinion, and my experience with regulators, where they look at. So what can the technology do? Not what the technology really is, so this, they don't want to know which, which crypto algorithm is used, which consensus algorithm is used, etc. They want to know what does the technology do and what are the functionalities, and that's where they're concerned, I, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think this is, uh, I would like to add two, two three more things because uh, regulation, uh, regula regulation is very often um, yeah, a bad topic in uh, such discussion rounds, but on the other hand side, we should not forget that it's, it's exactly the regulation which we have in place which is providing um, stability and also certainty um, such that actually the system works, right? But still, from a technology perspective, there is one very, very important point missing, um, which is currently not addressed by regulatory bodies, uh, which is that you don't have euro on a ledger. You don't have euro on a blockchain, you don't have cash on ledger, as some people call it. And I, I have the feeling that once uh, this is changing, um, then you suddenly have a huge array of new uh, business models um, because suddenly you then can program money but this is at this point of time at least in the financial sector um, uh, let's call it that way the um, the regular re regulatory body the bar and these guys need to deal with this um, Christoph Geitling maybe you know it he's the BaFin, uh, the blockchain expert at the BaFin. he has once been asked um, if the regulatory bodies have been those people who have put the no in innovation and he said, of course, no, because he's providing safety, but I, I still like this kind of uh, saying, uh, if, if, it's, if it might be the, the BaFin and these guys who are putting the no in innovation. But let's, let's uh, come to our uh, final uh, question. In case you would have now, say, 5,000 euro, uh, what would you do with it? Would you like uh, keep it on your bank account? Uh, would you buy uh, the, the, the stocks of a commercial bank? Uh, would you buy a big car? Would you would you invest in mining? Would you buy uh, traffic cards for mining? Uh, would you buy data art stocks if these exist? Uh, what, what would you do with 5,000 euro? So, so as I started with cryptocurrencies, they were very low. So either like being a couple of cents, Bitcoin being still in the two digits. Uh, I never invested in cryptocurrency. What I would do with 5,000 euros, I would go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably use it to develop a first prototype, start my own new business. I wouldn't invest in any cryptocurrencies or if that was your question. Or I would join Alex on vacation. <laughs> Being the developer of uh, that shiny blockchain, of course I would invest into, uh, I, have, I have invested heavily into my own blockchain, but actually, of course, apart from that, I do heavily invested into the Bitcoin. Uh, thanks God it was 400 that time, currently it's 8,000, just two years. Uh, 
I do not care about to what extent it may rise. As a venture investor, I do believe that I can lose everything. It was a small fraction of my investment portfolio, which was actually uh, dedicated to the cryptocurrency, just to understand the mechanism. And currently, it shows quite great results. But anyway, I do invest, I would invest almost all this money into this new industrial blockchain, but because I do believe that industrial blockchain without cryptocurrency is the next huge wave of the technology. Definitely wouldn't invest in any ICOs right now. Sorry, if anyone's into that. I think I would put my money into... Um, <laughs> um, well, no, that would lose money, in effect, wasn't it? Um, so I would put it into um, something to do with identity. So identity and, and, the, and the notion of an enterprise blockchain. This is all going back to the idea of why, why, why are we not innovating fast enough? Well, regulatory frameworks are there. Uh, identity is a really key part, and if you have identity in a proper manner, and we can discuss what that means, I think that'd be really interesting. The second part, though, is that I don't think identity is enough for the future because we have a massive establishment for the legal the legal processes for how we do contracts. You know, we, we have lawyers, we have entire judiciary processes. Um, when there is any dispute at all between two companies. Uh, based on their contracts, they will find some sort of, they will go to somebody to say, uh, just sort out this mess. Either, you know, there needs to be some lawyers involved. And I, I think right now, smart contracts, the way they're written, are for geeks, like you and me. <laughs> okay? Uh, and they need, to be, they need to be written in some other form. And I quite like one or two companies. I don't want to sponsor them, not, I don't, yours, okay. And then, yeah, so we talked about declarative languages, which is great. There's another one with Materian, yeah, uh, which is interesting because they're looking at Ricardian contracts. So these are contracts that can be read by real people, like lawyers. Uh, seeing the lawyers are real people, uh, and which I think they are, I'm married to one, um, uh, and and also getting read by machines. So my money would go into those sort of in, in, in initiatives because I think that's what's wrong. So to sum it up, so you, but, uh, you guys would at least uh, take this money and somehow put it into the blockchain space, uh, focusing on uh, exactly the last mile between the technology and the uh, real world, which in your case would be the, uh, the contract um, topic. Yeah, and you guys would be would go on. on I, actually, I wouldn't join you uh, because I would I would probably buy uh, Ethereum or things like this. Um, yeah, depends. Um, but I would then uh, join you next year maybe. Um, okay, maybe, maybe we have. Yeah, I would then sponsor uh, your holiday. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So any, um, maybe any any last questions from the audience? Um, any questions? Raise your hand. Um, we all agree that uh, blockchain technology is going to be the big technology, which could be bigger than internet. Um, that's why I'm here today. But that also scares me because today, as we can see, there are very few women. So um, you uh, you are here on the uh, on the this panel, uh, discussion panels. We all have uh, on the gentlemen. So my question for you is, um, uh, what can we do to bring more women in, in uh, new technologies, especially in blockchain? Because if women are not here, we uh, we women are going to lose power. A lot of opportunities. Thank you very much. That's a dangerous question because you actually you can uh, say lots of wrong things here. I will make a first tri a trial, and I I might be subject to criticism. But from my personal per perspective, uh, the blockchain technology is more or less coming out of nothing. And uh, we just got discussed about it later. It's it's like being on a sports field. Everybody is uh, on the line and uh, ready to start once uh, the shot is being done. Startups start running, uh, countries like Singapore are running, um, and uh, some are not running, uh, some countries are standing still, and so on. But the, the, there are no old, old boys networks out there, so everybody could start running, and therefore I could question also back, um, why aren't so few girls here? You know, there, uh, it's, it's, it's not about um, a proprietary network, which is kind of closed. Everybody could start running, and the question is uh, also maybe to you guys, or to you guys, 
um, why are not many more girls are running uh, when now the starting shot is uh, taking place? Yeah? For me, it's also an open question. I have no solution, um, but the, the conditions at this point of time are equal for everybody. Be it startups, corporations, countries, genders, the conditions are uh, uh, everybody equal. But um, this is my answer includes a little bit of criticism, um, uh, but maybe uh, you are more um, constructive uh, concerning uh, the answer. I, I don't know. We, we try, we try, we just have to try and, and we, we run programs where we go into schools and we work with all students, all backgrounds, of any of, of gender, any particular uh, culture, to teach them about programming, to teach them about building. And so we, we have programs like this that are sponsored by the bank, and we think that education is an important part, perhaps. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a big free world now. Folks will try to receive funding for their initiatives, so they will seek that capital. And so until the capital profile of the world changes, I, I'm not sure if I, that part of it is entirely true necessarily, but it's certainly the barrier to entry is much, much lower than it used to be. And, uh, you know, all hail the future. Let's, let's pick it up. At least for our experience, the best are crypto mathematicians, a women minority, and almost all are lawyers which understands the, that strange language of smart contracts that are so women. So we, we do believe that there is a, yeah, we, of course we are equal, there are some pros and cons for each and every position, but we think there is a huge, I mean bright future I would say, I mean for both genders of course. We, we just divide the roles. But in balance, balance in, in cooperation between genders too. Uh, <laughs> well, I actually think you should ask the women out there. Why are they not? I mean, if you ask us sitting here being men, I don't have the answer. Ask the women why they are not participating in that great opportunity. I mean, that's again our mindset. We are always questioning ourselves, why is it this or why, why is that? Think about the opportunity and either be part of it or don't. So go and ask the women out there why they're not part of that. <laughs> I'm afraid to answer. <laughs> um, I, I, I like your strategy today. I believe it's a cultural thing. Right? Um, having, having maybe, it's, it's starting at a young age uh, within school systems, but every country has its own school system, so maybe this is a, a global cultural problem. Um, the, I, I can read the, <laughs> the, the, the women that I know within the uh, blockchain space, they can ask, they're very, 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 very good sometimes mostly even better than, uh, than the men. Uh, I fully agree that there are a few women in the blockchain space, but um, I think there are general few women in the IT space, so maybe it's, a, it's also a general IT problem, IT industry problem, not only a blockchain problem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe one, one more question, uh, or, should, or you decide if we should close uh, the round because we are over time, um, or maybe one or two more questions. Raise your hand. But I have, uh, I have, I have